Good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight with Annabelle Tiffin. Our top story, swift and tough justice. After days of unrest around the region, the first sentences for violent disorder are handed down. Police are gearing up for more protests tonight with refugee charities and immigration centres targeted. Guard of honour for Becky as the funeral for the Northwest Tonight presenter turned firefighter takes place in Cumbria. We continue our trip along the region's coast, dropping in on the charity that helps wheelchair users enjoy a day on the beach. No, you're running! Can you run as fast as Keeley? The gold medal winner puts a few hopefuls through their very, very quick paces. And after a relatively lovely start to the day, a lot of us have seen conditions like this around the region. Today, what's it looking like tomorrow? I'll have all the details at the end of the programme. Three men have been jailed for more than seven years for their part in last week's riots in Liverpool and Southport, the first in the country to be given prison sentences after the recent violent disorder. More than 100 people have been arrested across this region and police are scouring footage of the violence to identify more suspects. The judge in Liverpool today said he had a duty to impose sentences that would deter others. Lindsay Prosser reports. <laughs> After days of violent disorder across the northwest, politicians and police promised offenders would face swift and tough justice. Today at Liverpool Crown Court, the first sentences were handed down to three of those involved in the riots in Liverpool and Southport. The judge said those sentences were intended to punish and deter others. After attending last week's vigil in Southport, Derek Drummond headed in the direction of the rioting. He admitted violent disorder and assaulting a police officer. Drummond was sentenced to three years' imprisonment. Declan Geeran from Liverpool was involved in the rioting in the city centre. He set a police van on fire, then watched it burn. He received 30 months' imprisonment. The disorder at Liverpool's pier head drew Liam Riley. He claimed he wanted to show support for the bereaved families. He's been imprisoned for 20 months. The Crown Prosecution's message is clear. Whatever your motivation for targeting police, inciting hatred or wreaking havoc on your community, you'll be swiftly punished. The speed in which today's defendants have been arrested, charged and sentenced bears out the government's warning of rapid justice. Today the judge said that sentencing courts have an obligation to do what they can to ensure the safety of the public and that severe sentences will be handed out for offences connected to or involving widespread violent public disorder. The Chief Constable of Merseyside Police, Serena Kennedy, provided an impact statement which was read to the court. She said, the level of aggression that I witnessed, which was directly aimed at my officers, is unprecedented. It was horrifying to see. There have been nearly 100 arrests across the region. Greater Manchester Police charged another seven people today. Merseyside Police have a team of 55 officers combing footage of the protest, trying to identify suspects. The North West courtrooms will be very busy for weeks to come. Lindsay Prosser, BBC North West Tonight, Liverpool. Well, police forces across the northwest are gearing up for another night of disorder with threats of anti-immigration protests outside refugee charities, hotels housing asylum seekers and law firms providing immigration advice. Premises in Manchester, Liverpool and towns across Lancashire could be targeted. Well, let's join our reporter Phil McCann, who's in the newsroom for us now. And Phil... For obvious reasons, we're not going to uh, say exactly where these protests might take place, but shops and businesses in some of those locations are already planning ahead, aren't they? Yeah, these targeted locations you mentioned, Annabelle, uh, immigration lawyers' offices, immigration centres, that kind of thing, but some of them appear to be private houses that people have registered their immigration-related business to. One in Lancashire uh, used to be an immigration lawyer's office. It is now, though, a tailor's shop. Despite that, it still had to board its windows up. Local shops nearby are still are also closed today. And a reporter 
uh, for us who have spoken to there tonight said that there appear to be large groups of people gathering in the town, one in, a, in an apparent counter-protest, and all of this over a tailor's shop. Now, we've spoken to some of the businesses who appear to be the targets on that list. Those that we've spoken to said they've told their staff not to come in today. Uh, they, one of them has sealed up their letterbox. Um, this is the scene next to one of those targeted locations uh, in Greater Manchester, and we've spoken to some of the businesses nearby. I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't understand, but we are shut down, so we're not earning nothing. If this gets torched or whatever else happens, destroyed, I've got 30 years gone up in smoke. Like I said, a lot of our customer base are from the Muslim community, and it's affecting them. They're scared to go out and they're scared to leave, and don't really know. It's going too far, isn't it, really? The world's gone mad, hasn't it, these The world's days? gone mad, mate. I mean, everyone from our units all left, but we've got work to do at the end of the day. We're not going to stop our work, you know what I mean, just for these protesters. It's no good, man. It's obviously a very worrying time for those businesses, Phil. How are the police uh, planning to deal with this if any protests do go ahead? Lots of police officers, Annabelle. The Prime Minister a few days ago talked about a standing army, didn't he, of officers ready to respond to this. Well, we understand that some of them will be, tar will be located at strategic points on the motorway network so they can zoom off to any locations where there's particular trouble. There will also be lots of police in the locations that the police know about, of course. Um, there is, in Merseyside, a dispersal order in place for parts of South Liverpool, Wavertree, Toxith, Sefton Park. That means that the police can move people on if they suspect they're going to become involved in antisocial behaviour. And there is uh, enhanced stop and search powers in place across the whole of Liverpool for police officers. But there's so much uncertainty. There are meant, supposedly meant to be uh, protests planned in Salford and in Liverpool over the last two days. They came to absolutely nothing and there have been rumours flying around on social media about planned protests or supposed riots today. Uh, Greater Manchester Police say that they are heavily resourced. Their advice to communities tonight is to stay calm. Phil, thanks very much indeed. Well, that disorder that we've been talking about was sparked by the killing of three girls in Southport last week. Today, the inquest into their deaths was opened at Bootle Town Hall. The coroner said it was impossible to adequately articulate the devastating lifelong effects on their families. A service for one of the girls, Alice Aguirre, was held in Southport last night. Andy Gill reports. None of the families of Alice Aguilar, Elsie Dot Stankham and Bibi King were in court for today's 15-minute hearing. Only journalists attended. The Sefton Council flag at Bootle Town Hall was at half-mast for what the coroner called a short, sombre and formal process to open and adjourn the inquests. The court heard details of how Elsie Stankham and Bibi King were identified by police officers from their clothing and from recent photographs. Alice Aguiar was identified by her father, Sergio. The coroner's officer gave a brief description of how 26 children were in that dance class in Southport when, at about 22.11 on that Monday morning, Axel Rudikabana entered and allegedly began stabbing people. Today's hearing allows the funerals of the three girls to take place. The inquest won't resume until the conclusion of criminal proceedings against Axel Rudikabana. He's been charged with murdering the three girls and with ten attempted murders. At the conclusion of the hearing, the coroner, Julie Goulding, said, it is impossible to adequately articulate the devastating lifelong effects the truly tragic events have had and will continue to have on the parents, families and friends of Elsie, Beebe and Alice, who cruelly lost their young lives in such horrific circumstances. A Southport businessman who confronted the attacker told BBC Radio 4 about the encounter. When I opened the door, he was stood there, he had a hoodie on, but most of his face was concealed. Uh, we locked eyes on each other and he looked pretty menacing. And then he came at me. I wasn't able to get the knife off him, but I don't believe he managed to hurt anybody else. Last night, a service was held to remember Alistair Silva Aguirre, her parents among those mourning. One of her teachers read a tribute. Alice would be there to help you. You should always remember her big, bright smile that made your day so much better. If I could describe her in at least three words, it would be amazing, caring and confident. And that she definitely wasn't annoying like some girls are. <laughs> <laughs> The inquest into the girl's death will resume next year. Andy Gill, BBC Northwest Tonight.
Right, let's get some of the region's other news now. And changes have been made to the flagging system and crash barriers at the Isle of Man's Southern 100 road races after a crash in which a competitor and a marshal died, an inquest has heard. Racer Alan Connor and volunteer Liam Clark were both killed when Mr Connor missed a chequered flag, signalling he should slow down at the end of a qualifying session in July last year. Yesterday, a coroner ruled Mr Connor's death was misadventure while a verdict of accidental death was recorded for Mr Clark at a separate hearing today. Blackpool Central Pier is closed until further notice after a woman fell 30 feet through a section of the flooring yesterday. She was taken to hospital, but the extent of her injuries isn't known. Now, our former colleague, Becky Barr, was described as a woman of remarkable achievement in everything she turned her hand to, as family and friends paid tribute at her funeral today. The 46-year-old from Lancaster, who left presenting this programme to retrain as a firefighter, died last month after being diagnosed with abdominal cancer. Kevin Fitzpatrick reports. A guard of honour from the Lancashire Fire and Rescue Service and the Girl Guides welcomed the funeral cortege as it arrived at a crematorium in Milnthorpe in Cumbria. Around 200 people had gathered to pay their respects to a woman considered a friend and inspiration to many. After being diagnosed with incurable cancer last year, Becky had planned her funeral and chosen some readings. It was an emotional day for her friends who she'd asked to speak. It was a real privilege to be asked to be involved in the service today. Um, and we just wanted to do her proud and I suppose give everybody a flavour of what she meant to us and what she meant to our friends and, and her family. Her main aim throughout the whole illness was to make sure Hannah was prepared, Hannah, her daughter, prepared for um, what was to come. And that was really her, her focus was always on other people, not on her. And that's very typically Becky. Absolutely. In a stellar broadcasting career, Becky worked as a business reporter and presenter before returning to her roots here in the North West. We loved it when on a, the Friday night occasion we would present the main programme and it was a Lancaster takeover. She was incredibly proud to come from Lancaster, from Lancashire, brilliant at broadcasting, but brave to, to say, right, I want to do something else and became a brilliant firefighter. It was a change of career that took many by surprise, but in the five years she was with the Lancashire Service, Becky made a big impact on her colleagues. When she came in, everyone was a little bit suspicious. They thought she might be doing some kind of panorama documentary and they were always a bit uh, sceptical about why she was coming to the fire service, but I just think she genuinely loved people. She wanted a change and she was such a brilliant person to work with in the end and we all absolutely loved working with her. Away from work, it was time with a daughter that Becky cherished and she became active in the Girl Guides as a leader with a local group. It was a lovely service. It was very touching and very personal, but it, it was Becky all over. It showed all her characteristics. She led it the way she wanted to. She inspired people even today and that was what was important. Becky said she'd wanted hers to be an example of how to die well, with grace and acceptance. Described today as a formidable friend and a force of nature, it was a celebration of the life she'd lived. Kevin Fitzpatrick, BBC Northwest Tonight. Well, next tonight, we have been taking a look at some of the nominees for the BBC Make a Difference Awards hosted by our BBC local radio stations. They recognise those who go above and beyond to help people in their community. Billy Higgins, a karate instructor in Lee, is one of them. He's been teaching martial arts for 60 years. He's now nearly 80. Molly Brewer went to meet him. Yeah, mate, not fast enough. Block fast. One. Karate is all about dedication and discipline, something Sensei Billy Higgins has by the bucket load. He's been teaching martial arts for more than 60 years. This year, he'll turn 79. I'm on my third generation now, and uh, some of them are still training. This is it's amazing. The good thing about a karate class is the discipline. You know, you just say a word, yame, and nobody moves. Make a good stance, everyone. Come on. Eyes front. Don't be distracted. Ready? One. That's it. Bit wider with your stance. I taught a generation, so he taught my daddy. He got to black belt and he's taught me. I'm a fifth dan now and he's taught both my daughters. My dad used to do it when he was a little kid. I couldn't even punch when I first started. And, and now I'm a, I'm a purple belt, so 
Because of Billy. My mum, her coach was Billy and she used to be uh, go to the uh, karate. I feel like he's taught me so much. Billy is now based at the Sadokan Karate Club in Lee, but during his career he's been all over and even won gold with the British team at the 1975 World Karate Championships in California. But things took a turn for Billy two years ago when he was diagnosed with cancer and had to have his eye removed. But after a maximum of three weeks recovery, he was straight back with his students. It was the biggest shock ever, suddenly, you know, go in the hospital one minute, come out missing an eye, you know. Karate people get straight back into it. So, yeah, it's that mental attitude, I just want to get back and train. Despite dedicating his life to karate, Billy has no plans to hang up his obi anytime soon. No plans on stopping. Just get up in the morning and go and train, you know. It keeps you alive. It really does. Molly Brewer, BBC Northwest Tonight, Lee. You must keep you young as well. He looks amazing. Now, we're going to be profiling a few more of the Northwest Make a Difference Award nominees over the next couple of weeks, and our local radio stations will be announcing their winners next month. Uh, now, Emmanuel joins us for the weather in just a minute, but when the weather is good, many of us love to spend a day on the beach. But if you have issues with your mobility or are a wheelchair user, it can often be frustratingly off limits. A charity in Fleetwood, though, is helping to change that. As part of our series on the northwest coast, intrepid reporter Ellis Palmer grabbed his trunks and headed to the seaside. Well, at least the sun's trying to poke out when I arrive in Fleetwood. We're blessed with a fantastic and very coastline here in the northwest. But all too often, I'm limited in where I can go as a wheelchair user. But I'm here in Fleetwood today to meet a group of volunteers who are making the beach accessible and creating special memories. The charity was started in 2018. It aims to get everyone out and down the beach. So Mick, how are these different from normal wheelchair? In this particular chair, it, it uh, reclines, the, uh, the legs go up as well so that we can put them in various different positions. The arms... Uh, Mick right dreamt up the idea when he saw a young wheelchair user unable to get to the sea. The tyres themselves are very, very large. They're three pounds per square inch, which means that they can go across virtually all terrain. In you go. For a change in facilities as well, so it's easy to get ready and move across from one wheelchair to another. We've got the sink that rises and falls. There's a privacy screen there and a complete shower unit as well, so that you can do everything you need to do in complete and utter privacy. Over a thousand people so far have booked in, and there's no age limit. What better way for Irene to celebrate a century than a paddle in the sea? And one user has made a lasting impression. Leighton. Unfortunately, because of his lack of mobility and the fact that he was a wheelchair user, um, he wasn't able to access the beach. So when I found here, it was a great thing to find and that um, we were just able to transfer him from his own wheelchair into the, the wheelchairs that they provide here. And then he was able to go onto the beach and into the water. And what was that water like? Cold, um, but Leighton really loved it. And at one point we parked him in a stream that was running through and he just spent a long time in there just looking down at the water, really loved it. It meant so much just because the beach had never been accessible, so to be able to have their memories as a family and access the beach and the water is just really, really amazing memories. A month after his visit, Leighton died. It is a very emotional place for me to visit, very, very special place for our family. What do you get from working with the service? Tremendous satisfaction, just so lovely to see the smiles on people's faces, whether they be young or old. So many people have either never been on the beach before or certainly haven't been on for the last 30, 40 years. Um, we're all in tears sometimes, volunteers as well as the clients. It is lovely. And now it's time for me to get ready for the beach. And joining me are Matt and Megan. We can get right up into the water. We know that it's safe and it's comfortable and all these fantastic people help us. And it's just brilliant. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. 
can go in us into the sea, but uh, it's a way of, of getting to enjoy the sea as a wheelchair user. It's fantastic. If you're planning on coming down, make sure you book. Mick and the team now hope to get everyone surfing. If that happens, I'm definitely coming back. And it's Palmer in the sea, somewhere off Fleetwood, BBC Northwest tonight. He is such a brave man. Well done, Ellis. And what a brilliant idea, because it's not really been good weather for going to the beach, has it, Emmanuel? Not really, no. Um, good evening. So, you know, I do have a thing for um, sunrise pictures. So we had some lovely ones sent in earlier today. Things have started to cloud over a little bit for much of today, and we've had a few showers as well. But what is it like where you are? Send me your weather pictures. And also, you can also sign up to become a weather watcher as well. So how is it looking like tomorrow? Well, not great. We do have a lot of cloud in the forecast and outbreaks of rain as well, which will be heavy in places. And that's because we have this warm front moving in from the west and that will bring us the cloud and the rain as well. And because it's a warm front behind it, we'll have warmer air. But I think tomorrow night into uh, Saturday, tomorrow night into Friday rather, we'll be seeing um, a cold front moving through and that will bring us something fresher. So Friday, we do lose that rather mild air. So tonight, though, relatively settled, one or two showers, but then I think clear and dry overnight. Into the early hours, you can see the clouds thickening, some more showers as well, and temperatures between 11 and 14 degrees Celsius. So that warm front tomorrow bringing us an increasing amount of cloud. Initially, we'll see some showers, but then as we head into early afternoon, mid to early afternoon, then you can see the heavy rain moving through. The, the wind will pick up as well, wind gusts potentially up to 30 to 35 miles per hour. So a little bit more drier as we head through tomorrow night. And then I think you can see that, that cold front moving through from the west. That means that Friday should be a lot fresher. We lose that slightly milder air as mentioned, but Friday itself relatively pleasant day. Of course, there are a few showers in the forecast, but it should be dry overall. Some sunny spells and temperatures getting to highs of around 21 degrees Celsius. And then into the weekend, relatively settled. There is, of course, the risk of further showers, but you can see temperatures climbing by the time we get into Sunday. Back to you. Well, that's good news. So we are getting a little bit of warmer weather then. Yeah, eventually. Sunday, yes. Yeah, and then it breaks and we get rain again. <laughs> It's always the way, do you do the weather it? from now on? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Emmanuel. No Thank you very much for watching. I'll be back with your update at half past ten. Join me then. Bye-bye.